welcome uh, to today's uh, event, uh, which is uh, an IGC event uh, uh, with the title From Adversity to Resilience, Climate Justice in Developing Countries. Uh, this public lecture is part of the LSE Environment Week, as I think almost all of you uh, know, but we're very pleased to be inviting the online audience to join us uh, tonight as well. I'm Jonathan Leap. I'm the Executive Director of the International Growth Center and delighted to be moderating uh, the event tonight. Before we get started, let me just review a couple of the housekeeping uh, items. The event will be live streamed uh, to our international audience and we're also recording the session and really hope to be able to make both a video and audio recording of the event available on the LSC and the IGC websites. We will have a designated time at the end of, of the uh, discussion for question and answer from the audience and including the online audience. So we'd encourage you to submit questions as well and you should do so using the Q&A box. Um, we have a colleague here who will then feed me questions and I'll share them with the, the in-person audience. Please also feel free to contribute to our online conversation using the hashtag LSE Environment Week. We're delighted today to also be launching the IGC White Paper on Sustainable Growth, Innovation, uh, Growth, and the Environment. The mission of the IGC is to work in partnership with policymakers in developing countries to promote inclusive and sustainable growth through pathbreaking research. The White Paper sets out a new research agenda for the IGC that focuses on meeting the challenges of climate change while continuing to drive the transformational growth that lifts people out of poverty and raises living standards. The paper provides a comprehensive review of the existing literature uh, and the existing evidence and highlights where new research is most urgently needed to drive effective policy. The white paper, which marks a significant shift in our direction, builds on extensive consultations not only with our research directors across all of our four themes, but also with all of our initiative and country teams who have fed in um, ideas and concerns from our policymaker partners. I'm delighted to start this evening by inviting Robin Burgess, who's a director of the IGC and a professor of economics here, uh, to provide a brief overview of the white paper. So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, we're, I think, in day two of Environment Week, uh, more days to go after this. And the reason that I wanted to kind of uh, present some stuff here is that what we're going to hear about a lot in this session is about innovation. But we typically think about innovation, things like solar panels or technology. But in the, in, in the case of climate change, we're going to need innovation across a much broader <clears throat> set of areas. And what I wanted to do is to kind of tee up Oriana's talk, which we focused on social protection, by pointing to some other areas that were covered in this, uh, in this white paper. And to begin, um, and sort of <clears throat> pushing also in the direction of the, the topic today, which is climate justice, it's, it's worth just sort of showing a couple of graphs. And indeed, everything in my presentation will be graphs. It's a new, a new way of doing things. It's more interesting to look at pictures than words. But this is a picture on the top of where the uh, effects on mortality, above 65 mortality by the end of the century. And you see something which is really striking, which is there's actually going to be some improvements in mortality from climate change in the colder uh, regions of the world. So the, the main picture you get from the top graph is one of inequality. And I think that's where we begin with climate justice, is that the creation of the problem was unequal, uh, but the effects are also deeply unequal. And unfortunately, those things don't map onto one another. 
And in the bottom, we see the picture of what has been the sort of traditional focus of development economics in poverty, where again, you see that exactly the areas that are red in the top <coughs> graph, uh, uh, top map, uh, are those which are going to be most affected. So what I wanted to do today is just focus on a few areas where I think there's a particular need for innovation. And one that we've been discussing extensively today is in the area of climate adaptation, social protection, and that will be well covered in the rest. I won't focus on that. I wanted to focus more on um, even within countries, so this is India between 17, and these are the effects of different days of temperature on mortality, so it's like the, the global picture. And you see that the same weather variation is having a much larger negative effect on it, so it's elevating mortality in India much more than it is in, in the US, and that's for a whole host of reasons. But the interesting thing is if you break up the Indian graph, you see it's all being driven by rural India. So this goes again to a lot of the stuff we're doing with BRAC, that there's a group of people, often in the countryside, often in subsistence, often not doing a lot of trade, who, you know, with, with very, very small firms that are being most affected. And then as you move across the arc of development into sort of more specialized employment in multinationals, more trade, even if you're in India, those people have been much less affected. So there's an even a within... Uh, within country inequality, very stark within country inequality that we need to address, which then points to how do you redistribute both globally and within countries, how do you ensure and supply, which is an area that Oriana is going to come to. But this is the third thing I wanted to show, which is, unfortunately, the, the path of emissions is going to be mainly in the lower middle income. So that's, it's, not, it's not okay to say, well, we're just going to do all the mitigation over here in the industrialized world and we'll leave adaptation for those countries. So you've got something which is why I'm going to say quite a few things about clean energy, which is we're going to have to have both innovation and diffusion of clean energy in order to address the global mitigation problem. And a lot of that is going to have to occur in countries which are already being negatively affected. So it's an incredibly complex issue, very unlike the traditional focus of development, which has been on poverty, because it, everything affects everything. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we haven't yet set up ways of sort of redistributing money to the places that need it, or moving the technologies and, and practices which will lessen emissions uh, to those areas where the emissions are growing incredibly quickly, because that's where growth is taking place. And you need the growth poverty. So it's, a, it's one of those problems where so once you get into it, you can't really focus on very much else because it's so existential uh, because that path of development in terms of the improvement of living standards is so huge what happens to people's welfare. But it's, again, that path which is creating all these emissions. So how are we going to have growth which is cleaner, which will allow people to get out of poverty but um, uh, reduce sort of negative externalities from that? So in, in the spirit of kind of keeping this short, I just wanted to, to, to point to one thing which I, I, I've kind of noticed recently, which is overwhelm. So you see this. This is the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable. Everything is here. We have to do all this stuff about it. And so I think one sort of objective and environment week is actually to come up with some concrete stuff that we could get, be getting on with, rather than saying we've got to do everything. We, we need to have things both in the adaptation space and the mitigation space which we can actually implement in real time. Because when you, you know, I've just spent a couple of weeks in Bangladesh and you can already see the effects of climate change. There's not time to sort of wait until we can do all this stuff. So I think actually, kind of a moving from looking at climate impact to climate action, I guess, is one thing I want to point to. And then, obviously, when you look at mitigation, energy is huge. And much of that energy is, as I said before, that, that energy use is growing in the countries which are most affected, lower middle income countries. So in the remainder of the talk, I just wanted to sort of say two main things. There's clearly a huge space for social protection for climate adaptation. We had a session today. There's going to be a much more discussion. That's enormous. But we can't stop there. We have to think of other areas of innovation. And one that came up today as well is that there's spaces, such as in the area of tropical forest loss, where if that forest goes, it's no longer just a concern for Indonesia or Brazil or the Democratic Republic of Congo. It affects the whole world. 
So how are we going to move money to conserve that forest if that's indeed the best action that we can take to prevent uh, emissions increasing? And there's a bunch of work which um, uh, Alan Xiao, who I think is here, has worked on showing that, for example, just looking at um, palm, which is uh, an industry mainly in Indonesia and Malaysia, that that is already the emission from par the palm industry is above that from the EU. So what that points to is that you need areas of conservation such as this is just showing that most of those emissions are coming from peat uh, when, you, when you cut down the forest and burn to create palm, that you need to start getting much smarter about which parts of the forest you conserve because the value of conservation varies dramatically across different parts of geography. So if you look at any geography in, a, in, in, in different countries, there'll be different parts which are worth much more in terms of, for example, conserving carbon. And we have the measurement to figure out where those areas are. We don't yet quite have the m means of paying people to conserve those areas. But that's going to become, I think, quite a, large, a large market. And then finally, just on clean energy, just three things and I'll stop. The, the, the kind of story that I have is when, when I was working in Bihar, and this is a graph from Bihar, in a four-year period, we saw a move of electrification from 73% of households being un this is rural uh, Bihar being unelectrified, and four years later, moving to 36%. It's a huge increase in electrification. The interesting part of that is a lot of this was being driven by solar. And so then we became interested in, well, where is, where is all this coming from? And working with um, Yifan Wang here um, and uh, D David Laszlo and Ignacio Banyaris and Paul Simpson and John Van Rien, and we've been working basically for the last three years trying to figure out how did the solar industry develop in, in, uh, in China. And what we found, which is interesting, is that there's the well-known thing that more and more energy is coming from solar, so the, so the orange graph is, is, is solar. And even more well-known graph that it's a fall in price. The thing that we really found which was interesting is that a lot of the um, innovation is happening in, uh, in, in China. And so what you're seeing in countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and African countries is the move of those technologies into those countries. And I'll focus on solar here, but the reason, and this is basically just showing you in a, in a you know, and I love maps. This is 2000, there's nothing. This is patenting in solar in different city regions in China. And you can see as we go through, you start to see more and more patenting. And then the black, the black circled city regions are where there's been subsidies given by the city governments. And what we find basically is in those areas, you get an even bigger increase in patenting. So this is basically industrial policy to encourage the solar uh, industry. Now, what's really interesting for the kind of countries that we're, we're working in, in the IGC is that as those panels leave China, and this is a picture of Chile when they built a transmission line from the north, which has very high solar potential, to the south, the, the, as you get to greener, uh, bluer marks, the, the electricity prices. So as you penetrate the renewables into the grid, the, the price fell. And there's also papers showing that health and so forth from pollution, found health increased. So I guess what I'll finish with is just by pointing to one central thing, which is underpinning all of this kind of clean, the, the clean growth plot is going to have to be cheap, clean energy, basically electrification of everything. And I think what we're, what we're still lacking is a real understanding of what is it that facilitates the movement of that renewable energy into the grid, into transport, into cooling in these different countries. And there, there's a real opportunity to really expand our knowledge on how to do that. Because that's going to make a vast difference, not just for the, um, uh, the emissions, but also for the productivity of these places. Because they often have high potential in these, one of these renewable uh, sources. So I thought I'd stop there just to kind of end with, I guess, a little bit of hope that what's happening in China, which is this dramatic fall in prices, is going to lead to diffusion, which you don't necessarily, even though China spent a lot of subsidy money on this, you don't necessarily have to subsidize in many of the countries where this diffusion is taking place. And hopefully similar things will happen with other types of energy. But I will stop there. Thank you very much. Great.
Thanks very much, uh, Robin. So that's really teeing us up for the main focus of today, which is on adaptation and resilience. And these are, of course, among the greatest challenges, particularly for uh, uh, developing countries. So what we want to do today is to explore where research and new policy innovation and so forth are, are most needed in order to meet, uh, to meet these challenges. And I'd like now to introduce um, our very distinguished uh, panel. Um, the person who will give the initial uh, presentations, my colleague Oriana Bandiera, who's, uh, as you know, is the, both the research program director for the IGC um, uh, and a member of the IGC steering group, but is also the Sir Anthony uh, Atkinson Chair in Economics and co-chair of the Hub for Equal Representation at LSC. Um, uh, we have three uh, senior policymakers uh, joining us. Uh, let me introduce first Chipo Monawasa, who is policy advisor to the president of Zambia, uh, His Excellency Hakeinda Hichilema, and also serves as deputy head of the new presidential delivery unit. Then uh, uh, next to her is Ali Safraz, who is now Pakistan's ambassador, permanent representative to the WTO. Uh, but previously very involved in, uh, in these issues, uh, serving in different capacities, but including as chair of the Punjab Planning and Development uh, Department. And then uh, finally, Asif Saleh, who we're delighted to have uh, with us as well, who is the executive director of BRAC, which, as you may know, is one of the world's largest, if not largest, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations um, that has really been instrumental in lifting millions of people out of poverty, and, and he brings uh, experience in senior, in senior leadership across really a range of different uh, types of roles. Um, uh, delighted to have you and delighted to have all of the panelists with us. So let me now uh, ask Oriana if she could uh, start us off with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, so today I'm going to talk about poverty. Poverty at the very micro level. Normally, when you go to talks about climate change, we look at big aggregates. We look at countries and, uh, and the like. But we want to see how climate change interacts with poverty and how we have to adjust our social protection strategies to take care of that issue. Now, when we think about social protection strategies, we can broadly classify them in two groups. One type of social protection is that which supports consumption. So you have a group of people who do not manage on their own to be able to work and afford enough to survive, and they are given, ideally, an integration payment to be brought out of poverty. Um, the second type, more ambitious type, of uh, social protection strategy is that which enables production. That is, it allows the poor to learn the skills or to acquire the financial assets which they need to exit poverty on their own. Um, okay, that's quite small, the font, I don't, but it, it doesn't matter, you don't have to read it. Normally, consumption support is made of very small transfers, and the implicit assumption is that basically the poor have all the opportunities to not be poor, but they just can't manage. So the only thing we can do is to support their consumption. The enabled production is, at the other extreme, very large transfers, which are meant to push the poor out of the poverty trap, if that's where they find themselves. And again, the underlying assumption is that they have the skills and the motives to work, but lack the opportunities to do so. So one is give people fish, the other one is teach them how to fish. Now, we recently have put together a database of uh, cash transfer programs, which have been evaluated. One great thing about economists getting involved in the evaluation of policies is that now we have a very large number of estimates of the same parameter. So what I'm showing you here is the increase in consumption as a function of the size of the transfer that people get. And this, in a way, is often seen as a blessing for donors because it doesn't matter how much or how little you give. This is expressed as a share of household consumption. 
So if you give 0.2%, so 20% of a yearly budget, consumption goes up by 15%. If you give three times as much, consumption still goes up by 15%. So why give more when you cannot obtain the same result? Well, obviously, if that's how the data look, it must be that the share of the transfer that you consume is much larger when the transfer is small. Okay? So small con transfers that support consumption are entirely consumed. Bigger transfers are only partly consumed. The rest is invested. So this big push type of policies, which is uh, the prime example, is a very successful graduation program that BRAC created. They reduce poverty by allowing the poor to invest. They give the first big push that gets them out of the trap, and then the poor can invest on their own. So we've been collaborating with BRAC since 2005 to evaluate the graduation program. And uh, we have two key findings, which of course are in three bullets, because uh, counting is not my strength, you know. <laughs> Economist and maths is overrated. <laughs> Um, so the first is poverty traps are real. So the poor can stay poor because they are born poor. The second is that the graduation approach is effective at breaking the trap. And the way it does it is by jump-starting investment in productive assets. The costs are eye-watering. I think when the first um, wave that we evaluated cost about $1,000 per household. That is quite expensive. But the benefits are way higher. And the reason why the cost-benefit analysis comes out so positive is that you pay the cost once, but you reap the benefit through the lifetime of the, of the beneficiaries. This all looks fantastic, right? So why are we worried? What's the problem here? Well, as I said, the, the program jumpstarts investment in productive assets. This is across the waves where we follow uh, 6,000 people. And you see, and this is the difference between those who escape the poverty trap and those who don't. And you see that the difference in productive assets increases through time. But investment requires expectations which are stable about the future. This mechanism will completely fail if risk increases, because people will not be confident anymore to put their money into an asset which might be literally washed away in a couple of years' time. And what we see is that over time, this is the historical series of natural disasters starting from the 1900s, there's been a huge spike in natural disasters, mostly led by an increase in floods. So earthquakes have remained the same. Extreme weather has been going up. Floods by now account for about one half of the natural disasters. And this is Bangladesh. This is brand new data, which <laughs> Ifan and Isabella spent the last few nights put in together. What we've done, we have collected data on flood exposure of Bangladesh across the years. The darker the color, the longer the flood exposure. Exposure, sorry. 2001, 2002, three, four. So it gets worse, but it also gets a lot more unpredictable. 80 is the number to remember. 80% is the proportion of the rural population in Bangladesh that depends on agriculture. And 80% is the proportion of land that's in flood plains in Bangladesh. So we really must consider the effect that this increase in risk will have on the, the poverty reduction strategies and the social protection strategies of Bangladesh. But as you saw in the map that Robin showed you, Bangladesh is not a unique case. Nearly every country 
in the lower income band, if you want to use that, of the World Bank, is exposed disproportionately to climate risk. Notice that the problem hits precisely where people are less equipped to deal with it. Because you say risk, well, risk, there is insurance. Why don't we just buy insurance? Insurance markets are very thin in these countries, so we do have to actively think about insurance. And the way that people normally insure is informally through their social network. Now, that works very well if you have an illness, because you're ill, your cousin is not ill, you borrow money from your cousin, and then if he gets ill, you give money to him. So that works. But if the entire village is underwater, there's only so much that your cousin can do, which is pretty much nothing. So one pernicious effect of risk is that people adapt on their own, and they can adapt by reducing investment or shifting to safer but less profitable technologies. So they could reduce investment altogether. There's no point in buying a new cow if I think that next year is going to die in a flood. So we see already evidence of this happening. These are brand new data that we put together. Oh, well, this looks too small. Um, these are basically the ultra poor population which was treated in 2007, and in blue, and in green, those that were treated seven years later in 2014. And you see here, focus on the blue line, uh, what we have on the horizontal axis is the number of flood days in the previous five years. So here you have the productive assets that these people have uh, today, well, today, in 2018. And on the horizontal axis is the exposure to floods. And you see that's a measure of investment, the blue line. And you see how the investment of these people just goes down as the exposure to flood increases. On there is financial savings. So it's two forms of investment in productive assets and in financial resources. And that also goes down. So we really cannot think of social protection in isolation from climate change. Climate is the air that we breathe, is the condition of the environment around us. It's impossible to detach it from any consideration, especially when it comes to reduced poverty. So we have a new initiative with BRAC, which we call BLUE. That's BRAC and LSC against ultra poverty and pro environment. As part of this initiative, we are thinking on how to adjust the programs how to adapt in order to adapt. Okay. Uh, so for instance, we're thinking about adding an insurance component. The problem with insurance is that it requires an exempted payment, and the poor, by definition, do not have much money to spend. So there is evidence uh, that uh, and I'm not already cited today on conditional loans, that is loans that you can take out if the flood gouge in your village tells you that the flood is above a certain level. And the cool evidence about conditional loans suggests that people invest more when they know that in case of flood, they can get the loan. And because they invest more, they're less likely to need the loan. So in practice, the lack of uptake of this loan is a measure of its own success. We're also going to look at promoting climate resilient assets, so uh, crops that are more resistant to flood and the like. And importantly, as we were discussing earlier, at community level interventions, because the flood is a problem at the community level, and so it makes sense to target it at the community level. But watch this space. There is a lot of interesting work, hopefully, coming up soon, and we look forward to the discussion and making progress on this.
Grazie a tutti. Great, thanks very much, uh, Oriana. You've given us a lot to uh, to think about and now to uh, now to talk about. Let me uh, come first to you, um, Asif. Um, in the context of developing countries uh, like Bangladesh, and of course, BRAC works in a number of other countries as well. What are the specific challenges you would identify as being the most pressing obstacles right. to supporting those who are most vulnerable to to climate risks, in that sense, to achieving climate justice? Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, right, this is working. Yeah, um, just to kind of give a very quick uh, background on, is, I mean, a lot of people know that BRAC started right after Bangladesh's Liberation War, uh, which happened in 1971. Uh, but the precursor to the Liberation War was actually a cyclone that happened in 1917, November. In a lot of cases, it was one of the worst cyclones ever where 500,000 people died. And uh, the response or the lack of it um, was one of the bubbling reasons why East Pakistan kind of revolted as well, right? And when, when our founder, who used to work in a UK-based company, but in, in Bangladesh's office, so he actually went to see the, flood, uh, the cyclone-affected area, and he saw all those dead bodies. And that was his kind of turning point where he decided that he wanted to set up something because uh, he didn't see any point in terms of living a regular life. The reason I'm telling that story because he said that at that point that he, did, he thought that it was not the cyclone that killed 500,000 people. It was the poverty and the vulnerability that killed them, right? So why they were living in those areas? Why didn't they respond to, uh, when the cyclone happened? To move. So I think it's a number one, going back to your question now, the number one re, uh, sort of way to ensure climate justice um, is really let's not take our, our eye off the whole extreme poverty agenda. So I think essentially there are still 700 million people who are extreme uh, poor. We made a commitment, SDG Goal 1, by 2030. But that ball has shifted. COVID happened, a lot of things happened. And every crisis that happens, including whether it's climate change or COVID, we see it's always the extreme poor, the marginalized, who are always the worst affected, whether it's pandemic, whether it's slow onset disasters like climate change. So I think, I think essentially ensuring social and economic empowerment to the extreme poor automatically reduces their climate vulnerability as well. But of course, as Oriana's um, presentation actually highlighted, that you know, efforts like graduation uh, approach, uh, that, you know, there are a lot of lessons there, which now we need to kind of not only work towards on the poverty angle, but at the same time apply on the with the climate change lens take that from the household level to the community level, how we can build more resilience and protection. And there's a lot of things to be done in the coming days on that. Could you give us some examples of where there, because BRAC's been a leader in a number of these areas, and I wonder, especially now that BRAC is operating in so many different countries, you right. have some understanding of things that are more transferable or less transferable, and I wonder if you could pick out some of the things that you think are probably most important for governments to be thinking about in applying the kind of tools to addressing the risks of climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think in a sense, uh, one is that, I mean, we when we are looking at climate uh, adaptation mainly, because I mean, I think for countries like Bangladesh, that's like the number one challenge right now. It's, it's become an existential crisis for us. And for a lot of the countries, BRAC operates outside Bangladesh as well. I think that's that's the case as well. Um, so, so essentially, there are like a three-pronged challenge. There are huge sort of so essentially, I mean, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, it's not necessarily like you need to bring a lot of brand new innovation on everything. You know, there is you need to not necessarily re-engineer all the wheels as well, right? So there are existing stuff that needs to be tweaked. We need basic critical services support in a lot of these areas. In, in some of the maps that uh, Oriana showed that, you know, some of these coastal areas are dire need of water. 
they don't have any part of it. People have to travel miles now because the entire land uh, is the salinity has become so persistent. So critical services, hum basic humanitarian services is needed. Then you have the development services. So we, there we are trying out rainwater harvesting, uh, sort of how do you kind of filter reverse osmosis, um, water entrepreneurship, so there are approaches in household level, community level, and it's also not cheap, right? I think the financing is, I mean, we're gonna talk about that later, but, but essentially I think, I think that critical service is one element, the development support where essentially loss of livelihood, where your climate adaptive agriculture comes in, where your alternative different livelihoods, and this is essentially the biggest thing that we need to look at, that people are displaced, people are moving because they are losing livelihoods. And so how do you create alternative livelihoods so that they are not displaced? How do you kind of mitigate the risk, which is essentially the third element where the climate lens and the science comes in that can you use better use of data, uh, whether it's satellite imagery, whether it's the insurance data, can help mitigate the risks of all the disasters that are coming in. So essentially, you know, you have basic humanitarian approach, you have traditional development approach, and then you have some level of climate smart programming that all three needs to be there. And of course, what Robin said that, you know, you're operating in a world where you, are, you not only have to keep your plane flying, you have to change your engine as well for countries like us because you know you need to look at the mitigation aspects because you know I've, I've been to the uh, I was just there a few days ago in a southern coastal belt and there you know it's almost the same story where you know you have um, salinity uh, and and people are doing all these uh, shrimp farming which is destroying the land right mm -hmm. now if you want to get them off shrimp farming that's a basically you need to either give them alternatives you need just transition for them to move away but here again, like the adaptation and mitigation will need to work hand in hand for countries like us. So there are a number of examples like that. Great, thanks very much. Let me turn now, uh, Ali, so first to you. Um, uh, as I said in my introduction, Ali brings together both previous experience working with these micro interventions and, and graduation programs and similar things, but is now at the World, at the World Trade Organization. Um, so I wonder if you could sort of take us up a level and say, how do you see these sorts of efforts around supporting uh, resilience and adaptation and achieving climate justice into the international trade negotiations and policies and, and so forth, where, of course, we already know that things emerging from the EU and the things threaten to go the opposite direction uh, for developing countries. So I wonder if you could just say something of how you see this agenda being carried into the WTO. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. Uh, let me start by saying uh, that the word climate justice and the word justice itself, I don't agree with it. It's justice is because it, it's, uh, it's, in the legal world, has very different connotations. It is as if somebody has done a, uh, a civil wrong or a criminal wrong and uh, something is being done. Um, I would actually peel it and then talk about two important principles which are climate related and which are important. Uh, which are generally supported by the, uh, by the group of uh, LDCs, these are the least developed countries, as well as uh, the developing countries. Although the definitions are getting blurred because China, India also, and so is Brazil part of the developing countries group, um, and they contribute a lot to, to pollution. But coming back to the two principles, one is the um, Common but differentiated responsibility, CBDR. We love our acronyms at WTO, and there are lots, <laughs> lots, and lots of acronyms. So that's one. And the idea is, it's it's a it's a it's a collective challenge, as we've seen in the presentation. If something is happening, let's say, with respect to the rainforests in Brazil or Congo, you know, it's it's not only those countries which are going to get affected. Smog is affecting, for example, both India and Pakistan. So if there's burning of, of of uh, crops and rice stubble in Indian Punjab, it affects the Pakistani Punjab. So it's a common issue. But what we are stressing the principle is a differentiated responsibility of different countries. And depending upon, and there's two letters that are added, which are the RC, and that is the respective capabilities. So 
capabilities would mean, okay, common issue, differentiated responsibility, but then it depends upon the capacity capability. And the second important principle is polluters pay. So whoever is polluting pays. Now the question really is, which gets more complex is, um, do we count from today? Do we count from 1,000 years ago? What's the cutoff point? But we believe, uh, and when we say we, it means uh, not just the government of Pakistan, but also, in general, the like-minded countries. We also include Bangladesh, uh, includes India, a lot of developing countries, and LDCs. We believe that uh, the polluters should pay. And that should take into account a cutoff date. That's the first bit. The second, what I would like to say is that we believe, Pakistan as a country believes in sustainability, and that's you know, there's a different definition for everybody. At WTO, or we believe sustainability depending upon our current economic conditions. Uh, we, we have signed up the, uh, the Rio Declaration, the UNFCC. Um, the UN building where it happened is you know, about 100 meters away from the WTO building. So it's, it's applicable all across. So we believe in, in that because it's important even from Pakistan, you know, keeping all these international commitments, agreements aside, as, as we don't want to create intergenerational inequity. And, and that's very important and critical. Now the question is how you weave trade into it. And we have seen one model where the European Union has come up with carbon border adjustment mechanism, essentially putting, <clears throat> imposing a tariff or a tax on products which are manufactured and there is a carbon in their supply chain. Uh, this is something that the developing countries look at with a lot of anxiety. How it will be applied? What are the principles? Uh, would it be used as, as another barrier to trade? Uh, developing countries and LDCs, and they're already struggling. As we have seen, I don't want to go into the discussion on you know, adversely affected country like Pakistan. Uh, we probably contribute 0.1% on the carbon footprint, but yet we are the, among the 10 most vulnerable countries. It's, it's not our fault. We didn't do it. You know, we, we faced flooding last year, we, and the damage was around $30 billion. Uh, so, and economies are generally dependent upon agriculture are more likely to be impacted by the environmental impact. And that's where the bulk of the adaptation work goes. Um, so that's one. The second is, uh, and we've seen in one of the slides that 75% of the contribution is coming from energy. Now we have our nationally determined contributions which as part of our commitment under UNFCC, uh, but a country like Pakistan needs $100 billion for that energy transition. Now, where that $100 billion will come from? On the one hand, the, the principle could be, well, the developed countries should give us a grant of $100 billion. Not going to happen, not workable. On the other hand, we say, okay, let the market do it entirely. Again, it's not possible, very difficult, because a high-risk economy, as we've seen here in presentation, environment increases risk of investment, apart from other risks. They will, you know, if Pakistan can't give them the kind of risk-adjusted returns that an investor will be looking at, right? So we need something of a double bottom line. Impact investing, which generates sufficient returns, but also development returns. Now, that is something on the basis of which, uh, you know, we can work, and we are trying that uh, these these funds may be created. Uh, the developing countries could set up risk guarantee structures, which actually uh, take away some of the risks of the investments, and also share the returns that are generated, the financial returns that are generated. So, uh, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Great. No, thanks very much. Let me move on now to, um, to Chipo. Um, in light of the disproportionate impact of climate change on women in Zambia and elsewhere, could you say something about the specific policies and initiatives that the government is considering to ensure that climate adaptation and resilience strategies are both gender responsive and empowering of women uh, to actively engage in sustainable solutions while addressing the particular needs and challenges that they face. Thank you, Jonathan, and good evening, everyone. And 
I have to begin by saying that I'm embarrassed to say this, that, but I don't think that Zambia is actually doing enough um, in this space uh, in terms of climate justice uh, in relation to <coughs> women. There does exist um, what we call the Gender and Climate Change Action Plan 2016 that was developed a couple of years ago in 2016, but nothing more has been, been done. Notwithstanding this, I think this is a, an area of um, interest to raise an opportunity um, to do some research and work to what could possibly be done. But there are already some thoughts that of listening to Rob and uh, Oriana um, that we might want to think about in, in terms of um, women and the climate uh, justice question. And I may repeat myself from what I shared in the earlier session during the day, so I do <clears throat> ask to be forgiven in advance for those of you who were, who were there. Now, um, we heard that energy plays a huge component um, around this, and uh, for those of you who might be familiar with Africa or not, I'll just share uh, an image that I want you to have in your minds. So picture um, a woman, you know, who's having to walk an average of maybe 10 to 14 kilometers in one direction to go and get some firewood. When she gets there, she has it on her head on her way back. She also carried an empty container to just fetch some water. So on, on, on one hand, she has a 20-liter container of, of water, and she's got a baby months old on her back and a toddler on the other hand. And this is, you know, a typical image you would see uh, in most of rural uh, Africa. Now, that, those distances, as we've heard, are actually growing longer and longer. So women are having to walk further and further to find this firewood because there's so much deforestation and walking longer because the water holes that they usually rely on are even um, further. So you, you, you find, that, and this is unpaid for work, by the way, so there's already an inequality issue. But when we now start talking about you know, innovations in this space and prioritizing, and we heard from Oriana that when there's a flood, who do you prioritize when the whole village is, is flooded? So whilst we try and solve um, for the women, yes, it's, you know, we need to do a bit more for women because they're usually more impacted. We actually have to have sustainable solutions across. And this takes me back to the point which I, I brought up in the earlier session about trying to protect this um, biodiversity and ecosystem that already um, exists because if you think about it, the protection of the biodiversity is actually like the engine of the, the world. You know? So you actually want to protect this so that you mitigate even the need for um, um, women to walk longer. But as a solution also to the energy uh, aspect is we've heard that you know, there's introduction of solar mini grids that are being put up in these uh, areas as something that's innovative, but then you find that it's not affordable you know, for the average person living in those areas. So when we think of some of these innovative solutions, can we think about not only availability, so making it available, but also making it accessible as well as um, affordable? Um, I thought I, I, I would share some thoughts um, around that. And then I also wanted to share, and I'll take you back to the picture of the woman with the energy question, but now more on the water, is that some research was done in, in, in Zambia, or an NGO did some work to basically bring water closer to communities, and they, they drilled boreholes. Okay, so you might actually think you're doing a good thing that will actually work, but some of this innovation and research Shouldn't, should, has to take into consideration um, context uh, specificity. So a borehole was drilled to you know, reduce the distance um, of these women going to get this water, and they just walked past it every single day and continued walking to fetch this water. So researchers had to go back and say, but what's actually going on here? And the women actually say they enjoyed that walk, you know, because it got them to tell stories with each other and spend time with their kids, and they like the communal 
washing together. So even as we come up with these innovative solutions, I think we should look at the context and the social nuances that we have to deal with. Um, you might be thinking that you're providing a solution to a problem, mm -hmm. but you're not taking into consideration the, the context. So I thought I would share that right. as well. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, let's shift now to sort of a, a discussion a bit across, across the panel. Um, I wonder if I could, we, we've talked a lot about where we need to be, and I wonder if I could focus our attention on how we get there, uh, not in the sense of the little steps that need to happen, but more politically, how do we get there? So I wonder, uh, you work with lots of governments. Uh, you can't do everything yourself as BRAC, so the, the key to scale is getting the governments to do things, right? So I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how that advocacy and that, that engagement process works or what needs to happen on that level. Let me just ask each of you questions and then we'll sure. go. In the WTO, you have people on the other side of the argument, or the arguments you've talked about. So how is change going to happen at the WTO? So are there going to be coalitions? Are those already emerging? What is, what's the process by which we might see some of the, the kind of outcomes that you talked about? So right, before we get to you, then uh, for Chipo, you're the closest to, to government action, national government policy making and stuff, and you, you see that, I mean, you're absolutely at the center of that in Zambia. What do you see as critical to really getting the, the Zambia and the very ambitious government, um, current government, to really make progress uh, on, in this area, particularly, let's say, around adaptation and resilience? So, so I just wonder if we could then go in that order and just think about how change is going to happen or how, how change can happen. Right. So, um, thank you. That's, I think that's, uh, you know, we need to think about the, on the system level. And when you think about system level, there's no alternative to working with, without the government. Uh, so, so we, um, I think from a national level, if you think about it, um, from BRAC's experience in Bangladesh has been a great partnership with the government. So they let us um, do some of these large-scale delivery um, where we graduated almost like uh, 100,000 families every year. We have been doing that for the last two, two, 20 years. Now, um, in other parts, it's not, not so much the same. So I think in a sense, one is that government, also government needs to think about their relationship with non-government uh, organizations because that needs to be more strategic because a lot of the innovation actually happens on the non-government sector that can be really scaled up if there is effective partnership. On the other hand, uh, the, our experience in, in working with some of the governments has been, I think it's slowly growing. We now have a dedicated initiative to work with the governments. We have now, for example, started working with Rwanda and government in supporting and enhancing their social protection program, learning from the graduation model. Uh, we are working with the state governments of Bihar uh, in terms of also their strengthening their rural livelihood uh, generation. So, and I think, if this works well, then it's really going to stick. There we are also in some of the other countries, like in Philippines, Indonesia, where we are uh, kind of slowly work, uh, increasing. But I think that is the ultimate goal, that the strengthening social protection through the government and doing that in the multiple contexts is going to be very, very important. On the global level, one thing we need to do a better job is that really kind of highlighting that why investing in some of these climate-related work is actually a very good investment, same way the graduation has become. I mean, graduation, for example, you mentioned it, Oriana, that if you invest one dollar, you know, the return is about three three point two one, three dollars and twenty one from your LSE research that has come out. So this is like kind of showing that long term benefit is also applicable for climate related vulnerability and the investment in that aspect as well. So I think collectively we need to do a better job in not just showing climate related work as like charity or vulnerability reduction, but more from a really opportunity increasing production. Uh, you asked for one example. We have in one area, for example, where there is extreme salinity, we have started producing sunflowers and then linking them with this whole crisis with the sunflower oil that has happened around the world. The oil, uh, cooking oil ha happened around the world. So that led to some very interesting changes that is opportunity-wise that has happened. So I think taking some of these lessons from one part to the other and then looking at not just from the point of vulnerability but also as an opportunity. It's a very, very complex situation, but I think we are all connected more than ever to solve some of these uh, crucial challenges. So I'll stop here. Great, thanks. Um, Ali. 
Uh, thank you. <laughs> I think, um, uh, let me start by saying the good, the good news is that um, environment and multilateralism are one of the key things, and at least to the extent in the global agreements which have been agreed, the Marrakesh Agreement which set up the WTO, for example, uh, specifically mentions environment and sustainable trade, but keeping in view the capacity capability of every country. Uh, the challenges that we are facing right now is multilateralism is not working in the way it should at WTO. Now, it's very good to invest in green technologies, and all the targets could be agreed in the, in the, in the UN and climate conferences when it comes to WTO, and the developed countries ask for the policy space to give green subsidies for environment purposes. That's where the load of LDCs and the developing countries, they see it well. It's, it's, it's a measure where you are subsidizing uh, the local industry so they can increase trade, which is a violation of WTO agreement. Um, and that's where multilateralism starts to break down. Um, that's a big challenge. How, how to work out this problem? There needs to be investment, let's say, in innovation. But at the same time, you know, money is fungible. If I'm giving money for innovation, that would, that might result in subsidies. That's kind of a subsidy to the farms. On the other hand, we've seen the EU model, uh, where they're taxing carbon, but the developing countries and LDCs are saying, hey, listen, you need to cut down your carbon emission. You have the targets for reducing carbon emission, but in this particular legislation, which is now uh, in place, you are effectively taxing all the other countries, asking them to pay for their carbon emissions. And hence, that's another challenge. So what to do about it? You know, what is the solution? A, these solutions will work at a multilateral institutions. And trade, because it's all about commerce and it's all <coughs> about business. So WTO is a place where we are increasingly finding these issues which are coming up. Some of good things that happened last year, the ministers, for example, agreed on fish agreement. Uh, so the fishing could be done in a sustainable way. Uh, I think in a couple of months there are going to be very intense negotiations on fishery subsidies. But we see that you know, more and more we'll see environment and there's coming up, so there's a discussion on, on taxation on fossil fuels, for example, which is agreed multilaterally at the global level. Um, so I think there, are, there is space, there is policy space available, which can be created through collaboration where the results of that space, because as I said in, the, in my response to my first question, it's a common but, uh, you know, differentiated responsibility. <clears throat> it, is a common, it is a common issue the common issue, and in order to create global good, it is important that any results or any value that's generated or created is shared in a way. Now, what would be the rules of that? How it could be shared? How you increase the pie and make sure everybody gets at least, or in our case, we say at least we get the crumbs uh, at minimum. Uh, how that happens? Now, that is something which we don't know how to do. And I think this is something on which we are working very, very, very intensely more and more in these particular areas. Great. Thanks. Chico. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And so from, well, Zambia or African perspective, I think that um, African governments in general, in general have got like competing priorities when it comes, whether you're talking about mitigation, adaptation, or climate justice. And we are dealing with a very tight resource um, envelope. And we need sustainable solutions to these things. And that's why I liked uh, Oriana's um, presentation about having an investment, you know, except the subject of social protection, whilst we have increasing budgetary allocations, social protection might not necessarily reach everybody. You know, we'll reach, I shared earlier that in Zambia we have 1 million people out of 20 million people under the social protection, and this is a growing number, but we are, st we are still very much aware that we're not reaching everywhere, <clears throat> everyone. So what could possibly be something that's more sustainable, you know, to, 
do both the mitigation, adaptation, and meet resilience through climate justice. And I think it goes back to the question of financing mm. and that sweet spot which I spoke about earlier, that um, we need more data and research and evidence you know, that says this much you know, industrialization is okay and will still protect the biodiversity that we need to protect in the global ecosystem, you know, what is the, the balance so that these uh, countries in the global south, the developing countries, are still able to, you know, afford um, some of these um, solutions themselves internally because the money is not clearly not going to just drop from the sky. So I think we need to have sustainable um, solutions and it would be nice to see more data and research as to what is the middle ground you know, where we actually have industrialization and to protect um, the biodiversity uh, out there. Great. Thanks very much. Well, Yana, before we open it up to questions for the audience, are there any reflections you want to share in terms of the discussion we've had so far? No. Okay. <laughs> You'll have another chance. Um, good. So I, I'd like to go first to our <coughs> online uh, audience and... Uh, Kunda, sorry. Oh, great. Um, so, do we have three? Can we take three questions from the so online I audience? So, I have one. Um, thank you, Jonathan. So I have one question um, from the online audience. Maybe a bit louder, Kunda, yeah. it's a bit hard. Um. <coughs> Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay, so there's one question from the on online audience. It says, whether slash agricultural microinsurance is commonly proposed as a resilience building intervention for people in poverty, as climate risks continue to increase, will this cause such insurance markets to become too expensive to be viable or to fail entirely? Well, let me take three questions, so go ahead and give um, me two So we more. only have one question. Oh, you have um, one question so far? One. Great, okay, so we'll give the online, we'll give the in-person audience. Um, actually, why don't I take two more from the in-person audience? Yes, this gentleman here with his hand raised, and uh, this gentleman in the middle. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I was very interested in the reference to sunflower and the cost of cooking oils. I worked for a number of years in Ukraine as a contractor for the European Commission, and frankly, that was not the European Commission's finest hour of ignoring the warning signs. My question goes back to the start, but for everyone. Um, you made a reference to the vital enabler is clean, cheap, renewable energy, solar. How, how is that achieved in the tropics? tropical countries and neotropical regarding storage because you don't have the extremes of daylight and darkness. I, I'm just uh, interested to hear, is it achievable and how can it be achieved? And I found the lady's comment from Zambia very, very moving indeed, and I will certainly be taking the messages you gave away. Thank you. Thanks. And then this gentleman here in the middle, you said. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I just want to say thank you for the insightful panel and uh, the white paper. Uh, my it's question certainly is, if you could hold it close to your mouth. Hello? Was, yeah. Hello? Yeah. So my question is particularly for uh, the policy advisor, for uh, Ms. Uh, Chipa Monawasa. Um, so uh, upon taking office, I'm Zambian as well, by the way, um, so upon taking office, I believe the president made an announcement about a 3 million metric ton target for copper production. And at the same time, um, it's supposed to uh, sort of provide, um, uh, provide to the demand that's going to come from the electric vehicles. 
So that, that sort of reaching that target for 3 million uh, metric tons, we'll also see a lot of mines coming up. And there's also controversial areas in which some mines have been proposed, like the South Luangwa. Uh, Loa was it Loa Zambezi? Yeah, the Loa Zambezi National Park, very beautiful national park. How would you sort of um, avoid the sort of counterproductivity of us trying to increase the amount of copper, but at the same time avoid the possible environmental damage to the um, ecosystem in Zambia? Great. Thanks very much. Let's start with that one. Uh, Tipo, just uh, well directed to you and very <laughs> concrete, uh, and then we'll work backwards. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, I think, mentioned it earlier that we are a very ambitious um, government. So in addition to the target of 3 million metric tons of copper by 2030, the president has also challenged us that we should be able to double the production of electricity um, from its current 3,500, from what we found it at 3,500 megawatts, to double that by 2030 as well, which is quite um, ambitious. Now, this is what I was trying to explain, that um, it's, it's a question of how do we balance. And the reference that he made to, we actually have a controversial case in <coughs> Zambia where a mining uh, firm started, got a license to uh, mine copper in one of our national parks. Now, I don't know if you've seen the recent news on that, that um, the, the Zambia Environmental Management Agency, known as ZEMA, has actually pulled that license uh, back, and it's a government agency, and actually told that mining company to restore um, that uh, <coughs> degradation of the the uh, forest in that area. Now, it doesn't take away from the fact that we still want to achieve the 3 million metric tons because, and take advantage of the energy transition in terms of what that would do for economic transformation and where the world is going. So another thing that we are working on, and the president was addressing um, the nation just last week, Friday, and you may have, some of you may have heard him say this, that we are about to embark on a national um, geophysical um, aerial mapping, mineral mapping, that will be able to show us where um, the minerals are. And it doesn't necessarily <coughs> mean because you have minerals or diamonds in a national park, you actually have to rip the ground open. You can go mine um, elsewhere. So the last um, exercise of this magnitude was done in the 1970s. And today, only uh, about 50% of the country is mineral mapped. And we actually have a very strong, with some uh, data, very little data, uh, that these, the country is probably endowed with a lot of these uh, minerals. But we actually have to see where they are, protect the areas, and keep them protected. Something that might be of interest, actually, that the world may not know, but it's becoming more knowledgeable in Zambia, is that the first uh, president of Zambia post-independence actually deliberately put national parks where he knew there were minerals. So there's actually minerals in in every national park in, in Zambia. It was a deliberate strategy to actually protect those those areas. But we actually think there's actually more um, minerals. So there's a lot that Zambia can contribute to the uh, energy transition. Copper is one of the big uh, metals, and we have all of them, manganese, lithium, recently discovered also in, in, in Zambia, cobalt. So, you know, the world wants to <coughs> transition. They will have to let these minerals um, get out of the ground, but at the same time, we should be able to protect um, what, what, what we can. Great. Thanks, Tipo. Um, Robin, you talked about clean energy. I wonder if you want to say something about the question around the storage challenges uh, for uh, countries, and then I can invite the panel as well. But um, can we have a mic? So how we achieve this transition to clean energy given yeah, I the think, storage? I think just very quickly, two points. The, the, the stuff that was in Bihar and much of rural parts is basically a battery plus um, the, the solar panel, so you can do some stuff like charges, uh, uh, cell phone lighting, but the, the much more exciting end of this is solar parks, which are these big generation units, and there you have to combine it with much more, uh, m much more storage. 
the thing you have to remember, which is the critical, critical thing, is that all, all <coughs> middle and lower income countries are used to lots of outages. So if, you're, if, you, if you don't mind some outages, you can do an awful lot with solar <coughs> already, even without storage. You just have to sort of decide when you use it. So, that, so there's a lot you can do that basically the, the, the problem with storage has been overstated because we're thinking about 24 hour electricity where actually most countries in, in lower middle income countries, you don't have 24 hour electricity. So even with, without the storage right now, a lot of energy can come from solar and wind and you can balance those out with hydro and, and uh, thermal. So I think there's still Great. huge potential and it's been overstated this worry of, of storage. Great, thanks, Sean. Okay, I would, um, I would yeah, like can to I just throw the this. two questions together? So both this question about storage, but also the question about microinsurance uh, mm -hmm. there to anybody. So, okay, Ali, do you want to start off, and then Oriana, and then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to add to what you've added. One of the potential solutions could be global grids. So we have internet cables, which connects the globally. So we, why can't we have a global grid, which connects different distribution systems? Uh, that's yeah. And the second, the question you wanted me to start off. Oh, with well, the microinsurance question. Ah, there. the microinsurance. Um, so we tried microinsurance in Punjab, so I will tell you our experience. Um, theoretically, yes, if an insurer is insuring a community and there is a disaster, then uh, the insurance company will go under. That's correct. But that's not the way the uh, microinsurance for agriculture is done. It is actually done on a wider scale, so you want to reduce the risk. And secondly, it's, it's not like car insurance, not like specific to a particular farmer, let's say. It would be a particular to a huge area. And they will see what the average yield is over years, and then we'll see how much it has reduced and by what percentage of total farmers are impacted. So that's why they, they kind of de-risk the transaction in certain ways to make sure that uh, the insurance continues to work. You would l need to have large insurers for, for that particular purpose. Now, if let's say a whole country is affected and the business of that insurance company is only limited to that country, yeah, that's, that would be a risky proposition. So they might mm -hmm. want to work in multiple countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, Asif, sure. you want to say something? Then yeah. Just just briefly, I thought yeah. so we can get back Very to that. Very quickly, but I think we are seeing some promising uh, uh, behavior change. I mean, in, particularly in South Asia, uh, where, where people didn't want to pay for things that they didn't get right away, right? So there was that behavioral aspects. And, and one of the things we have in Bangladesh is that very large-scale microfinance network. And, and we are kind of reimagining the microfinance network as a really a distribution channel for different types of financial products and services. And, and again, with the engagement that happens with the people, behavior changes and other things, and insurance is also kind of strictly happening. And because of the unpredictable nature of the uh, weather pattern, and farmers are more and more willing to now take up some of these things. Now the question becomes that, exactly like you said, that how do we make it viable for insurance company, but at the same time, value generating for uh, the farmers as well. That is basically the big question. So mm. there's a lot of different types of things that are being tried on right now, uh, weather-based index, then aggregate yield-based uh, uh, insurance and others. And we don't know which one will scale as yet, but I think the early signs are quite promising. Great. William? Yeah, very briefly. I think, as I said, sorry, I don't know. You think it's, it's working? It's okay. Uh, so. I think the main problem is exactly that, that people who do not have money are not particularly willing to pay in advance for something that they might not need. And there has been studies that have shown that inverting the timing, that is asking for payment at harvest when people have more liquidity, uh, lead to a higher uptake of insurance. And, but there can be a lot more creativity there. So for instance, the, prog the product that I was discussing earlier was a loan that you do not pay for, you're just eligible for, and you can take it only if you need it. So there is a lot, a lot of innovation. I think the demand is increasing rapidly, so I expect the markets to, to grow. Chipo, did you want to add anything? To s well, I think it's fine. Okay, yeah, let's take another, uh, another round of questions. So uh, I hate this uh, gentleman here in the front, uh, at the very back, um, Ishita, and then um, over here. Um, 
So let's start, if we could have the mic here in the very front. And then, do we have two mics here? So the, the second mic, you go, you go ahead and go to, well, actually, why don't you go to, to uh, Mpatso, who's right here at the back, raising her hand. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for the presentation, really good. I have two questions, short, very short questions. One to Ali. Ali, you, you talked whether the polluter-based principle is a good principle if we have to kind of get those who are polluting to pay. But, but what's the experience in Pakistan? Can it work? And when this money comes out, where does it go? Then the second question I have go to Manawasa. Thank you for apologizing that Zambia is not doing much. But from the explanation, I find you're doing a lot compared to other countries that globally. Was it a way of telling us that we should all apologize and do better? Or there are some things that you feel you can share with us where you're not doing much? I thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, Impatso, who's there at the back, and then over. Um, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, my question is on the energy transition. I think we're aware that, you know, as we're speaking of energy transition, countries have the trade-offs that are going to come up. And um, I just wanted to learn from you both from the policy side and also from the research side in terms of, A, what do you think are the tools that policymakers and the information that they're going to need in order to be able to make the best decisions given the trade-offs that are coming as a result of the energy transition that we're talking about? And B, um, in what ways, how do you think uh, economic research specifically can contribute to ensure that these policymakers have the right tools to make the decisions that are, they're being asked to do as a result of the trade-offs that are coming about as we're talking about energy transition? Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And then just finally here. Hi. Uh, Oriana, that was masterful um, in the way you connected like climate and poverty through risk. Uh, but do you think climate funding is necessarily mindful of this, this linkage? Like, are they mindful that climate policy should fo like its foremost objective is to reduce poverty. That's one and a modified question um, of that for Asif. Do you think philanthropic funding um, or uh, philanthropic funding for civil society is necessarily also, are they also doing this? Are they mindful of, say for example, funds for research? funds for civil society uh, for climate change, are they mindful of this link? Great. Thanks. Okay, well, let me just turn over to the panel, so pick and choose which answers you'd like to, um, to start, and maybe I'll start with you, Asif. So I'll, I'll address the last question, maybe uh, Oriana responds to me. Uh, from a, what I see from a funding landscape, I think uh, no, the short answer is that people do not connect climate change and poverty as, as closely as they should be connecting. So that's why I think this global advocacy needs to happen. Because I think in a sense, uh, um, the, the philanthropic world particularly has goes through a lot of like uh, pads, right? So we know what's cool right now to fund. And, and oftentimes they look for newer things, that newer innovations to fund. Um, and, of, and as a result, so there are a lot of times I hear that, oh, uh, you are like, you cannot put in development projects as climate projects. That's why I, I was saying that. Ultimately, I think the, we need to also go to the root cause and not necessarily think that everything has to be reinvented. There will, of, of course, things have to be modified, but not everything has to be done from scratch. So there is a lot of advocacy that needs to be done on the philanthropy space. And I, I, I hope Oriana, the <laughs> rigor and research actually are gonna be a key part of this. I fully agree. Um, so I answer another question because okay. I, think yeah. that, I think that was a perfect answer. Um, it's about which data to, you asked which data should policymakers have. And I think the discussion that we had earlier this afternoon made me think, and I keep thinking about this, is the opportunity cost of the forest, the opportunity cost of the natural resources that we are asking low-income countries not to exploit 
so that we can still breathe after we've basically exploited all our natural resources. I think it's important to have that number. That is, what do they lose? What does Zambia lose by not tearing down a forest? How much could they produce <clears throat> in that forest? And that will, I think, be an enormous number, which will hopefully flip the debate. It's not a matter of us asking. It's a matter of trading clean air. Thanks. Ali, do you want to answer the question about the poor repairs <laughs> in practice? So it was a, a short answer. No, they don't. Uh, will they pay? Uh, very unlikely. And that's why I was saying is our experience, uh, the recent experience when uh, Pakistan faced devastating floods, there was a conference that was organized in, um, in Geneva. Uh, the UN Secretary General uh, hosted it. And there were commitments. Uh, the largest commitment was from the Islamic Development Bank, around seven to $8 billion. But the financial instruments were primarily loans. So they were long-term loans. They were very low-cost loans. But um, my view is that, yes, they will help us, let's say, in the short to medium term, having that have financing. But essentially, at the end of the day, the Pakistan will have to pay back these loans, and it increases our debt burden. What needs to be done is seeking more capital, uh, which, is, uh, which is seeking financial returns. Fine but at the same time with a very explicit mandate uh, to create and generate goods, public good in the form of uh, climate adaptation or maybe even mitigation. Or even adaptation at this stage would be great for a country like us. But the challenge for such of these funds is, is that the fund managers actually lose sight what the, you know, that they have a double bottom line principle. So the first, normally what happens, they would look at an investment opportunity and they will see, okay, what is the financial return? And then they will try to find, okay, this is how it is also helping climate. Uh, some of our colleagues in, in the development partners, in, in the um, global financial institutions, um, they suffer from this. Um, they, they times lose sight of it, uh, which is a big challenge. Now, I don't know how to fix it, but this is something that has to be fixed. Yeah, so, <laughs> excuse me. Maybe before <coughs> I go to the questions, I'll just pick it up from where Oriana left it about what does Zambia lose? <coughs> and this is where the data gap or the evidence is like missing. Um, but there are some, there's been recent research from a World Bank um, article that, that shows that in Zambia um, in 2019, uh, there was an increase in um, tourists, you know, who basically came into the country and went to all these places where you have protected forests like national parks, and they spent over $800 million uh, in that year. And currently, the tourism sector is contributing about 7% to GDP. And the projections of this are actually you know, showing upward. And this is where the question comes in, say, where do we put that $1? You know, and what benefit will it have you know, if you protect um, these areas? So I think those questions are very much in the pipeline. And I thought I would just contribute to, to the questions you're raising. But back to the question on the energy uh, transition and in terms of what should researchers and policymakers be thinking about. So I'll share some of the things that we are thinking about in Zambia and the IGC country uh, team are very much uh, part and parcel of this work. In fact, they owe us, owe me some, some policy papers on the EV industry in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Um, so we are actually creating, we are developing an, um, an electric vehicle uh, special economic uh, zone, like an industrial park, and IGC is supposed to basically provide us with some data and evidence in terms of, you know, how best to effectively position this 
uh, value addition, special economic zone, and attract investment there. And as policymakers, we are wanting to get, you know, most value before we actually export this raw material. And we see that it will create more uh, jobs even before we are actually able to use electric vehicles um, ourselves as a country. We'll be able to create more um, jobs um, in the country. And also some of the other aspects we're looking at is improved transparency around beneficiation. So, and increased in uh, joint ventures between um, the local indigenous people and the investors who are coming in. So thinking around energy transition in that way and critical minerals. So in the next, again, in the next couple of weeks, you hear that Zambia would have announced its uh, strategic uh, minerals, so critical minerals. There'll be a, a declaration on that and an explanation what that means, you know, that these are the minerals that we prioritize as critical and strategic as a country, and you find that there will be certain incentives and conditions tied to exploiting those minerals, and we see them as critical in terms of the energy transition. So there's a lot of uh, work going on, and um, mining is a priority area for the current government, and it's a priority area for the IGC Zambia uh, office as well. So keen to speak to you about that as well. There was a question on saying, oh, it sounds like we're doing a, a lot. It actually feels like we're not doing enough. And I, and I think it might be a good sign if you have a, a government in office, you know, that feels that way. We spend a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, we have a president who is a workaholic. And every day just feels like we just don't have time. And I was sharing this earlier, that we actually don't have time. Why in a hurry? I, I also said it earlier to the colleagues, say, I want to see some of this transformation whilst I'm still in government, because I don't intend to stay there forever, you know. So it would be nice to see what um, we can do very quickly, and we're relying on that speed based on the data that we are getting so that we make the right decisions, well-informed decisions with data and, and evidence. And Zambia sits in a really good place with a president that actually appreciates data and evidence. He's been um, here before. In fact, the first meeting that got IGC on board was in the new academic uh, building. And every time he's in London, he checks in with the, the team. And when they're in Zambia, they have a meeting at State House. So you can see how um, committed he is to actually get um, data and evidence in his decision-making process. But we need that that information to be coming slightly quicker um, than it is. And that's, I think, a challenge that's um, thrown to yourselves as researchers and um, analysts so that you don't miss out or, or give impaired uh, data by trying to rush. But if there's a way to speed it up. Great. Well, that's a great note uh, on which to end, um, and much better than I could have done. So um, <laughs> thanks, uh, Chipo. Um, so we are out of time. Uh, so let me just uh, ask you to join me in thanking the panel for just a very lovely... <laughs> and thanks very much to all of you uh, for joining us.